Hello YouTube, I'm the Angry Astronaut and this is... You know, there's some really obvious questions that people ask sometimes, but I'm going to go ahead and ask this one anyway. Let's say that you had tested a body of water for bacteria utilizing equipment that we had been using for the past century that almost never produced a false positive, and that equipment showed that there was bacteria of some unknown kind in that body of water. Let's say that you then subsequently did a second second test utilizing similar equipment at a totally different part of that body of water and it showed the same results, would you then let that body of water anywhere near your municipal water system? Well, of course you wouldn't, but that's precisely what NASA intends to do with Martian bacteria in the next few years. Let me try to explain why a sense of profound arrogance has led NASA to this conclusion and why we need to stop it. And no, I'm not one of those people who sees faces on Mars or pyramids on Mars. I'm simply a person who's listening to the conclusions and the opinions of two scientists who were first responsible for finding life on Mars in the first place on the Viking 1 and Viking 2 landers. And these are Dr. Gilbert Levin and Dr. Patricia Strat. Sadly, both of these scientists are no longer with us, and I think their opinions are starting to get drowned out in the noise, but let me give you a quick review. On the Viking 1 and Viking 2 landers, there was equipment that had been used essentially for a century or so to detect the presence of bacteria in drinking water. The idea is to take a sample of the water, or in this case Martian regolith, and expose it to nutrients that bacteria tend to be fond of devouring. In this case, they utilize nutrients that were present on the primordial Earth because they thought that these kinds of nutrients might be universally attractive to extraterrestrial bacteria. Once the bacteria devoured these nutrients, then after that they would release a certain type of gas, mostly CO2. Then they treated the nutrients with a radioactive isotope to make it easier to detect. This equipment was used to detect bacteria many, many times on Earth and never produced a false positive. Whereas when it was used on Mars, on both Viking 1 and and Viking 2, it also produced a positive result. NASA, of course, was not satisfied, nor should they have been, so they subjected the soil, or the regolith rather, to a temperature of 160 degrees Celsius, which NASA thought would be sufficient to kill any bacteria in the regolith that was causing this effect, but would not cause any major chemical changes in the regolith. Therefore, if this was being caused by some sort of mysterious chemical reaction, it would still happen after the treatment. And lo and behold, after blasting the regolith with this intense heat, there was nothing consuming the nutrients anymore. And Dr. Levin took things even further. He later subjected the regolith to a lower intensity of heat, 120 degrees, 130 degrees, which should have been sufficient to kill most, but not necessarily all of the bacteria. And and lo and behold, the consumption of the nutrients dropped substantially but did not go away. This is almost impossible to explain with chemical processes. As a matter of fact, people have been trying for over four decades to explain this with chemical experiments and have failed every time. The label release experiment, as it was called, has never been refuted or debunked over all this time. On the contrary, subsequent discoveries made by the Curiosity Lander especially have reinforced the notion that there is bacterial life on Mars. For example, seasonal spikes in oxygen and methane, processes that could easily be explained by abundant Martian bacteria, but are very
very difficult to explain with any other process. For example, blasting the regolith with cosmic rays would not produce these kinds of spikes in only a single year. It would actually take centuries to make this effect happen, and yet Curiosity detected these spikes on a regular basis. Both Curiosity and Perseverance have also detected the presence of organic molecules, which the Viking landers did not detect because they were utilizing instruments that were far less sensitive. That was something that NASA had a problem with back in 1976, but has since been resolved. Also, there are bacteria on Earth that can consume perchlorates and produce oxygen as a byproduct. This is something we have already observed and something that could perhaps be used to create oxygen on Mars and something that we are already seeing on the red planet. Oxygen spiking during the summer months when bacteria should be more abundant and this oxygen should not be there, at least as far as our understanding of Martian chemistry exists right now. There are so many indicators of the presence of bacteria on Mars and also no subsequent experiments have been sent to Mars to detect bacteria in spite of Dr. Levin enhancing his process and his equipment and presenting it to NASA only to be rejected repeatedly. And what I find even more infuriating is the fact that whenever you read an article about these mysterious spikes in oxygen and methane, and by the way, there are spikes of 30% for oxygen and up to 60% for methane. It's not like these are barely detectable spikes that we're talking about here. It also makes mention of the fact that we have no evidence for life on Mars. Really? With experiments that reliably provide evidence of bacteria existing in drinking water having produced positive results on two different landers under multiple different circumstances to make sure that they were producing reliable results, how the hell is that not evidence? And here's the biggest problem. Recently, NASA had some online discussions as to why their sample return mission, which is going to be happening in the next decade, is going to be so secure. They're telling us that the Utah Test and Training Range operated by the U.S. Air Force is going to be the proposed landing site for bringing back samples from Mars and that this site is going to be completely safe and secure. Bullshit. The only thing that's going to be safe and secure is to return these samples to a space station, preferably orbiting the moon. The Lunar Gateway would be a perfect destination for these samples, and I'm not the only one saying this. There is an organization of concerned scientists Dr. Levin and Dr. Strapp, by the way, were part of this organization before they passed away, who are arguing the same thing. Fortunately, NASA is giving the public a very limited time to provide their response and their opinions as to what should be done with the Martian sample return mission. To be perfectly clear, I'm not saying we shouldn't do this. I'm saying that we need to deliver the samples to a responsible place, nowhere on this planet. We need to be absolutely certain that we don't unleash some sort of alien plague on this planet. And yes, the general consensus is that alien bacteria would not possibly be compatible with anything that had evolved on a different planet. However, there is a vocal minority that argues, first of all, that we may have exchanged bacteria with Mars many times over the course of our planet's history, and so there may be some compatibility there. But but also that any bacteria that had survived the general decay of the Martian environment over the last many millions and billions of years may have adapted a greater variety of organisms that it could infect in order to survive simply as an evolved survival mechanism. Do we really want to take that chance? I'd say no. So linked in the description is your opportunity to send your opinions and you only have until May 15th, so don't waste any time. And in the meantime, smash that like and subscribe button. I hope you enjoy these bulletins and stay angry about space.